Hi, everybody. Welcome to worship with South Presbyterian Church's Acts of Faith community online. You can tell that I've moved indoors, but I brought some of the the flora with me. Um, you know, the weather events were keeping us, preventing me from recording outside. So we're indoors today. And we're so glad that you are with us for this 4th of July weekend. Today is the first Sunday of the month, and so we will be celebrating the Sacrament of the Lord's Supper. I invite you to get something to celebrate with, whether it's bread or a cracker or juice, wine, water, whatever you have, whatever you have that's near you. I mean, Jesus used things that were right around him that night, and so we should feel free to do the same. Our nation is reeling from yet another mass, ca mass casualty event, this time in Florida with the apartment building collapse there. Many of us are struggling with a heat wave crossing the nation where my, where my nephew lives in Montana, it reached over 100 degrees. We will continue to process the sentencing of the George Floyd murder case. And as we are all becoming more sensitive to the inequities in our nation, we find that celebrating July 4th and Juneteenth last month remind us that we have a long way to go in forming our more perfect union. But we are on the journey. Where we are, how far we've come, where we are being led, both as people of faith and as one nation under God. They let us remember that we are one in the Spirit. We are invited to embrace that. We are one in the Spirit. An attack on one is an attack on all. Success for one is success for all. E pluribus unum, from many, one. With that in mind, then, let us worship the living and the loving God by beginning with our centering question for today. What is your earliest memory of July 4th? Ready? Pause. Please join me in our call to worship by reading with me the words in bold print on your screen. On this holiday weekend, we gather together, appreciating our freedom to worship God. May God continue to bless the people of Jesus's way in this and every land. We draw near to God who rules over all nations. May God continue to bless those who seek righteousness. We seek to live in harmony and peace together with all peoples on the earth. May God continue to establish peace on earth and help us to understand that it begins in our hearts. On this day, when we celebrate the creation of this nation, we ask God to bless us that we might make our country true to its ideas of freedom and inclusion for all. Guard us from war, from fire and wind, from fear, violence, contentiousness, and division. Let us pray. We ask you, creator of all nations, to bless our world leaders. Give them vision and courage as they ponder decisions affecting peace and the future of our tiny blue ball spinning through space. Make us more aware of our duties and responsibilities as citizens and guide us, O thou great Jehovah, with your powerful hand of peace and justice. We ask as we come before you this day to offer our worship and praise. Amen. Now let us stand in the spirit as we sing together with Andy, our opening hymn, When Morning Gilts the Skies. Morning kills the 
Confessing is when we give up the notion that our way is right, and we open ourselves to the possibility that we might be wrong. Let us think of the actions of our nation, our church, and ourselves as we come seeking realignment with God's plan for us. Please join me responsibly in our prayer of confession. In the midst of celebration, we are also in sorrow. Lord, hear our cries. For all those who have given their lives so that we may have our freedom, Lord, hear our cries. For all those who struggle and strive against great difficulties, Lord, hear our cries. Yet, freedom is coming. We can hear it in the voices of the oppressed. Hope is coming. We can see it in the eyes of all those who despair. But we are impatient. These things that we thought were, were already there were only here for a few of us. Let us not give up on hope. Let us not give up on God. God is here. We count on God's presence with us to guide, heal, and uplift our spirits, to turn us away from our old ways that consume and divide. We call upon God to remake us in the image of wisdom and truth, in the image of Christ. We praise God who has blessed us with freedom and peace, imperfect and partial, though they may be right now. Let our lives be a blessing to others as we secure the fullness of God's desire for us, for our church, and for our country. Friends, the Lord who made the heavens and the earth hears our cries and answers our calls. Our hope is in the Lord, whose steadfast love endures with us forever. Amen.
In today's scripture reading, we are reminded of just how hard it is to go home again. Jesus has been preaching, teaching, and healing across the countryside, and he decides to take his disciples with him and go back home for a bit. We pick up the story at that point, as told in Mark 6, 1 through 6. Listen for the word of God to you as I read from the Good News translation. Jesus left that place and went back to his hometown, followed by his disciples. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. Many people were there, and when they heard him, they were all amazed. Where did he get all this, they asked. What wisdom is this that has been given him? How does he perform miracles? Isn't he the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters living here? And so they rejected him. Jesus said to them, prophets are respected everywhere, except in their own hometown and by their relatives and their family. He was not able to perform any miracles there except that he placed his hands on a few sick people and healed them. He was greatly surprised because the people did not have faith. May the Spirit lead us to fully embrace this message in our lives. Amen. Every parent and grandparent knows those whiny words from the back seat. Are we home yet? Every youth group advisor, every teacher who's ever taken a field trip, every person who has ever looked at a child in a car, at an airport, on the train or at a bus station. Are we home yet? What are we gonna get there? How much longer? <laughs> right? Well, we've all experienced that either because we're the adult or because we've been the child asking that. A husband asking his wife, when are we going home? Or planning ahead, a wife saying to her wife, I'll meet you at home. We even talk about home with our arts and crafts, you know, a husband who cross stitches for his husband, a home sweet home sampler. It's all about home. Home is where the heart is. There's no place like home. Did you notice that home can be either a place, like a house or an apartment, where you, you live and had some connection, or also it could be a city or a town, a region that you come from as well, right? Scots will sing of how their home is in the highlands. My brother just went back to our home in Oneonta. Though he hasn't lived there in 60 years and I haven't in 40, he still said, I'm going home to Oneonta. It's our home in a different way, for sure, than my home here in Rochester. But the word home brings with it something, I don't know, something different for each one of us, I dare say, depending on your memories and associations with it, no doubt. But for many of us, that sense of home is one of comfort and joy. I admit not for all. And so you all have had to create your sense of home. I know I've tried to recreate some of those feelings in the home that I've made with Carly and the other kids. Well, in today's reading, Jesus is going home, right? Mark tells us that Jesus left that place and went back to his hometown, followed by his disciples. He was going home. He'd been away for a while, traveling, teaching, you know, building up his following. And he decides to go home and he invites his friends along. Oh, like a lot of us when we were in college, we went home and said to our friends, sure, come on. <laughs> so he goes there and he does what he does in every town that he travels through. He heads straight for the synagogue and he starts teaching. Well, he's teaching away and this is a different place though. All of a sudden people are looking at him like, who does he think he is? Isn't that Mary's kid? Yeah, the son of the carpenter. Right. Where does he get off thinking he's a teacher or something? He's acting like he thinks he's all that. 
and they reject him. Boom, flat out rejected. Rejected by his own people, people who've known him his entire life. I wonder what that felt like for him. Did it make him sad or angry? Did he have a little bit of that, yeah, well, I'll show you attitude? He probably reacted uh, the way a lot of us do. That things like that happen. I don't know, though. Uh, he says, uh, Mark says he was greatly surprised because the people did not have faith. Um, not so sure they didn't have faith. It's just that what he said before is true. The prophet is rarely known in his or her own town. They don't know him anymore. He's been hanging out a lot with God. He's changed probably from the one that they knew. So is it really that they don't have faith or is it just that he changed? Had his people changed? Or had they always been that way? Had they changed? Or, or had he? I mean, something had changed there. Once he changed by hanging out with God, he couldn't return to his hometown and expect the relationships, the feelings that he associated with it, those relationships with individuals. He couldn't expect those to stay the same. Those emotions and memories that made that place home to him well, those were in the past. Since the term home is tied in with our relationships usually, when one of the people in the relationship changes, the sense of home has to change too, doesn't it? See what I mean? He couldn't go home because it wasn't home to him anymore. He had changed. He'd grown into who he was called to be. When I go to Oneonta now, it doesn't feel like home anymore. Rochester is home. And yet the memory of all that happened there in Oneonta, of the love that surrounded me there, that, that image, that association of home remains inside me, perfectly alive, as if it still existed down there on the Susquehanna on Interstate 88. That sense of home is here, but it doesn't exist when I go back there. See the difference? We are constantly building new homes, aren't we? New places. New places where we live and move and have our being because of the relationships that we've made there. We're constantly building new homes. We change or someone comes into our lives or we find a new community to be a part of and we begin to develop a new sense of home, mostly because we really carry home in here with us, right inside of us. When our lives are centered in God, every place is home because God is everywhere. And because God is everywhere and we're centered in God, home can be everywhere. The hardest part about changing where home is in our thinking is recognizing that the home of our memories doesn't exist anywhere else but in our memories. And as soon as we expect it to exist in this three-dimensional world as it does in our memories, we're going to be disappointed. And that's true, whether we're talking about moving out of a house that we've lived in a long time, or we're talking about moving across the country to establish a new home. It's true whether we're talking about Jesus taking his friends home to introduce them or show them off to people, or we're talking about coming home to in-person worship in a few weeks. It's true even if we are talking about our country, coming home to itself, recapturing our values, doubling down on 
patriotic music and fireworks for July 4th. The home that was is not the home that is. But that doesn't mean it can't be just as good or better than the home that was. What was is gone. Or as I saw on a sign in the Dansville Presbyterian Church not too long ago, there is no going back. Back is no longer there. Back is no longer there. I bring this up today for a lot of reasons. First, um, even Jesus realized, you know, we can't go home again. And sometimes the people who we are with the most often find it hard to let us grow in new and different ways. That goes for us too. Sometimes we find it hard to let ourselves grow in new and different ways, but we can. I think we're afraid almost of letting go of the familiar, of letting go of that home, that emotional home we had created. But we can let ourselves move forward and we actually might like where we're growing. But the second is that our church can't go home again. I don't mean back to a building. We're pretty safe on that. We don't want any part of that. But even back to how things were 18 months ago, before COVID, our acts of faith are going to be different from what they were because the needs of, of the community have changed. And the acts of faith model is designed to be organic outgrowths of the needs of the community, right? So if the needs have changed and, and we stick with the same old AOFs, it's not going to work. We won't be able to do the ministry that we've been doing. So our acts of faith are going to be different. Some may not continue. Some new ones may be added. We have changed. Our world has changed. Our country has changed. And our home has changed because of that. If we're looking for what was, we're not going to find it. But what we will find can be even better when we realize that our the home we're looking for is really the one you know, where, where we find God in our everyday lives. Whatever God brings us to do as a church will become home, right? And third, the same is true for our nation. That feeling of home that some of us may be looking for, that's gone for good. We have changed as a nation, for better or for worse, we have changed. So home has changed. We can nostalgically look back on what was. At the same time, we must excitedly look forward to what can be. The good news is that we finally have an opportunity to make this a great home for everyone and not just the owners of the house. We finally have a chance to create a home that reflects the kingdom of God and not just some human-made amusement park where everything looks beautiful, but they're just false fronts, facades on empty houses, that people pretended to have be homes. What we have said we want to be, what many of us believed we were, that comfy feeling of home has been shown to be a false front because it did not embody the values that many of us thought it did. And sadly, for our brothers and sisters, Black, Indigenous, Asian, all people of color, they weren't included, as many of us with beautiful beige skin thought that they were. So it's time to make it so they are included. It's time to change it. It's time to rebuild or add on to our home. Because now we are finally in the work of honestly laying the foundation for creating the kingdom of God on earth. The kingdom where everyone is related. And it will be a new home. A new city on the hill. It will be, well, whatever we make it. 
It's going to be up to us what it's going to look like. And we need to recognize the prophets among us, unlike Jesus' town people. Townspeople didn't recognize him. But we do have prophets among us, those who are telling us the things that are hard to hear, but calling us back to God. We need to remember that old saying that a house is built on bricks and beams. A home is built on love and dreams. We need to start dreaming again, I think, and go back over everything that's, that's already there to check it for structural stability, like in Florida. Do we want that part of our home to be part of our new home? We need to look at everything that we value. How do we make sure that everyone is included? For many of my black friends, July 4th was never a big holiday. Oh, there were picnics and things, but they didn't see that as their Independence Day. That would have been Juneteenth. The fact that as a white woman, I didn't know that for decades. The fact that I didn't even think about that. The fact that I didn't know about the massacre in Tulsa 100 years ago. Or the massacres that also took place in about 20 other cities that summer. Mass lynchings and bombings of American citizens in our own country mass incarcerations. Why didn't I know about these things? Because I was too busy living a life of privilege and I didn't even know that I was doing that. Though in my memories of home, or as I think of my image of our nation, I would have thought that things were okay. That we were learning how to grow together. That home that image, thinking it was a reality, is not real. We have to let go of that thinking that it was real. But don't let go of the image. Just come to understand that we have not yet grown into the full realization of the image. The home that we're making, though, the home that we talk about, the home where we are exploring these things that have yet to come to fruition. The home where we seek out the peacemakers and the prophets. The home where the teachings of Jesus are lifted up for the radical disruptor that he was. Now that home, that is one that I can't wait to move into and live the rest of my life in. Maya Angelou said that the ache for home lives in all of us. The ache for home lives in all of us. That's good. Because that means that the ache for God lives in all of us too. Because God is our only true home. With that though, we can make any place, any nation, any church, our home. And that's just what Jesus invites us to do. One way that we can move toward that is by celebrating a sacrament where we bring him into us in a new way. I invite us as we move into the invitation of uh, invitation to the offering that we move into that space of preparing to receive him in a new and different way. Amen. name. His love is burning in our hearts like living flame. 
For through the loving Son, the Father makes us one. Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share the Lord. No one is a stranger here. Everyone belongs. Finding our forgiveness here, we in turn forgive all wrongs. He joins us here. He breaks the bread. The Lord who pours the cup is risen from the dead. The one we love the most is now our gracious host. Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share the Lord. We are now a family of which the Lord is head. Though unseen he meets us here in the breaking of the bread. We'll gather soon where angels sing. We'll see the glory of our Lord and coming King. Now we anticipate the feast for which we wait. Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share the Lord. Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share the Lord. Today, as we remember the birth of our nation and the gifts of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, let us also remember the one who gives us eternal life, the one who would not let us go, the one that no matter how many times we strayed, strayed away from the understanding of our sacred relationship with our God, the one who wouldn't let us fall off and fall away and be forgotten. Let us remember that our home is in our faith, our God. And so we prepare for this holy feast with our responsive prayer. Please join me in the bold print on your screen. For the women and men who braved the long journey to become people of the way, as well as for those who share a dream of what this land might become now in order to embody the kingdom that Jesus inaugurated, we thank you, God. For the tribes and nations who inhabited this land for generation upon generation, truly children of the same God, though they have not often been treated as such, we thank you, Great Spirit. For patriots who dreamed of and fought for a free nation, even when their own lives were imperfect and they themselves engaged in our nation's original sin of racism. We thank you, everlasting teacher. For patriots who still dream of and fight for a free nation, even when their own lives are imperfect and they themselves engage in practices of separation and division, we thank you forgiving God. For those who built this country brick by brick, road by road, railroad by railroad, and town by town, including those who were enslaved and imprisoned, and who were not allowed to use that which they created, or who were then ostracized, scapegoated, and so easily blamed, with, when anxieties arose. We thank you, God of our better angels. For the innovators and artists, poets, musicians, teachers, farmers and factory workers, 
for all who labor and provide for the common good. We thank you, God, holy birther of tomorrow. For our own community, for those who came before us in this church, and for our neighbors near and far, we thank you, welcoming spirit. Just as the time came for you to send your son into the world, that we all might know you better, O God, we ask that you send him to us today, that we might live, might better live out our values, your values, and see through your eyes what we are unable to see clearly through our own. Come, Holy Spirit, and be with us at this table, across all time and space, with generations before us and those yet to come. Bring us to your table, Jesus, the table of grace and forgiveness, the table of love and oneness. On the night of his arrest, Jesus sat with his friends, much as we are sitting together now. Amid the laughter and small talk, as he looked around at those he loved in the light of the oil lamps, probably, he took bread and he blessed it. And he broke it. And he gave it to those gathered, saying, This is my body broken for you. Whenever you eat this, do so remembering me. And in the same way, he took the cup and he blessed it. And he passed it to them, saying, This is the cup of forgiveness, the cup of new life, the cup of a new covenant shared with you. This is my blood, which is shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so it is that we come together on this 4th of July to this one table, hosted by the one teacher, our mentor and savior, our brother and our friend, to share together the mystery of our faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Across miles and times through generations and millennia, we join with other followers, of this man from Galilee. And we pray as he taught us to pray, saying, Our Creator who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. My friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Happy are we who are called to this supper. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, almighty God, forever and ever. Friends, this is Christ's table, and we are all welcome here. He never turned anyone away, and neither will we. 
Wherever you are on your faith journey, you are welcome here. We will journey together. Come this day and be fed. Please join me in our post-communion prayer. Thank you, Jesus, for sharing this meal with us and for inviting us to your table. Thank you for claiming us as your own and for instilling in us your vision for the perfect reign of God's kingdom on earth. Bless us, we ask, and bless the work that we do to bring about your kingdom here your perfection through our imperfection. Keep us from coming to this table for solace alone, but fill us with your holy manna that feeds us on your spirit, that we might love kindness, do justice, and walk humbly with our God. We ask in your ever-living name. Amen. On this 4th of July, let us sing together a song of our homecoming. Lift every voice and sing. Andy?
of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of a new day begun, let us march on. Home is where the heart is, my friends. So keep God's love at the center of your heart. Leave your burdens here, whatever they are. Leave them at the table with Jesus. Go into the world to love and to serve God, to love and to serve one another. Return no one evil for evil, but in all things work for justice and righteousness. And may we find our home everywhere, everywhere that we share the hope of the risen Christ, the fellowship of the loving spirit, and the joy that passes all understanding and the light of the one who is recreating us every day, creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit. And let the people say, Amen. As our benediction response, I invite you to sing along with Andy one of our hymns of our proud heritage as people of faith, and then stay tuned for his postlude. Have a good and safe celebration of July 4th weekend, everybody, and we'll see you next time. God bless, and bye for now.
Thank you for joining us today. We're glad that you chose to worship with us and are grateful for your prayerful support of our ministries. We are a small congregation of about 50 members in upstate New York, but now we find ourselves growing to include some of you in Florida, Kentucky, Utah, Colorado, Arizona, New Jersey, and New York, all of us united by the spirit of the living and loving God. If you are watching this, we already think that you are part of us, and we would love to hear from you. If you would like us to pray for you, please send those joys or concerns to me through our website, which is on the end slide of this video. More worship services, as well as our weekday meditations, Prayerful Pause with the Pastor, can be found on our YouTube channel, South Church Rochester. If you are in a position to help support us financially, your gifts may be sent to us as seen on your screen. I hope you have a great week. We look forward to seeing you back here next time. Just remember, transform your spirit, transform our world. Bye for now.